In summer, this ground, sunlight hitting an ag crop, in this case rice, can make food for people. That makes a lot of sense. That's how we've been managing the valley. But in winter, when you spread water out, can you be making food for fish? How can we build a central valley that works for both fish and for farms? That might sound preposterous to some, but what we've been showing, what we've been demonstrating, first with rigorous science and second with partnerships with large production agriculture is that we can do exactly that. That if you understand how the Central Valley worked historically, how it functioned ecologically, how it produced ducks to turn the sky black, how it filled the Sacramento River with not just millions of salmon, but more diverse kinds of salmon than any other river system on the West Coast of the Americas. If you understand that and integrate that knowledge into the management of the valley, it's not a compromise. It's not water being taken from one user to another. It's not land coming out of production for another use. Instead, what we realize is that it's win-win. We end up with a system where we actually get more. Say that this table in front of us is the, the levee. On this side, we have the river, on the other, the floodplain. Carson built small cages out of plastic, uh, PVC and, and plastic fencing, two by two by four. He took a handful of fish from, uh, from the Colomy Hatchery, he put them into those cages. 12 cages on one side of the levee out in the river, where fish belong, right? And 12 out here in the muddy field, the floodplain. And what he found really uh, amazed everyone, I think. The fish that were on the floodplain grew at a tremendous rate compared to those that were on the river. Counterintuitive. Marsh, swamp, that's not salmon habitat. The river salmon habitat. And yet what we learn in the fifth grade really applies. Fifth graders learn that marshes, estuaries, Swamps are some of the most productive places on earth. Is it possible that that, that, that that rice ground can serve the same function for fish that the marshes did previously? So we're realizing that we're not going back, that that rice ground, some of which is the most productive on earth, is we're, we're not advocating for it to be turned back into waving fields of Thule. Instead, you're saying in summer, this ground, sunlight, hitting an ag crop, in this case rice, can make food for people. That makes a lot of sense. That's how we've been managing the valley. But in winter, when you spread water out, can you be making food for fish? If you use the ag apparatus that's already there, the canals, uh, the, the, uh, um, the water infrastructure that supports rice culture in the Sacramento, now you can use that water to flood those same fields in winter. In doing, can we mimic conditions that once led to robust, strong fish and to, and to abundant populations? That was the question that we went to try to answer about four years ago on Nags Ranch. So this is a diagram, uh, Rio Vista moving into uh, the bay at the bottom, the, the Sacramento River, Sacramento here, and then gray you have Yolo Bypass. Yolo Bypass, of course, is really the backbone of the Sacramento Valley's flood control system. This is where water on a, on a flood, instead of going down and trying to squeeze into the narrow Sacramento, moves across Fremont Weir here at the top, of the, and it's a, a pressure release valve, where four times as much water can move down through the bypass as actually can fit down the river channel. So when you're at the end of I Street looking up at water, Right about that time when things you know, start to make you nervous, most of that water ends up going down the bypass. That means that you still have a place where the river and the fish in the river connect with the floodplain. Um, that seemed like an obvious place to go out and try to look at these possibilities. Usually in November, after harvest, we would go out and we built some pens out there in, in, in the corner of one of these rice fields. We cut a corner off a 200 acre field, it was about five acres, just put up a little dirt berm. In essence, we made a puddle. In that puddle were these little net pens. Each one of those net pens received fish that came in a truck, 
from Feather River Hatchery operated by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Those fish were quite small, about the size of your thumbnail or so. They were measured. They were weighed. Because after six weeks, we drained that field. We were out there in the mud, catching this fish. This is the equivalent of the fast track device, right? You're reading the little code that's in that, in that fish's belly, tracking it, and what did we find? Well, we found that the fish that had gone in on the last day of January, weighed about a gram at that point, came out six weeks later, weighing about five times as much. Basically, yeah, it was five and a half, it was almost doubling their weight every week. These are phenomenal growth rates. That after those fish left the field, they swam down the canal beneath that the flows from the Nags Ranch down Yolo Bypass to the river. Some of those fish were captured about mm, 13 miles downstream or so. At that point, they looked like an entirely different animal. This animal right here has fuel in the tank. This animal can swim. This animal has packed a lunch, right? That is absolutely critical in its ability to survive both its out-migration through the river and the delta, but also in its time in the ocean. A large fish is much more likely to return as an adult than a small one. So we are seeing that the collaborative power of bringing water interests, farm interests, conservation interests together to pull in the same direction is allowing us to get more done more quickly than many of us really imagined was possible.